India's relationship with Canada is worse than it has been in decades. Credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India. Credible allegations that agents of the government of India were directly involved in the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar, on Canadian soil. Uh, uh, Khalistani extremists and terrorists are uh, deep assets of CSIS. The Indian government hired thugs to terrorize Canadians. Because the country that boasts about eliminating terrorists openly say that there is no place for terrorism anywhere in Canada. The glorification of death and violence and terror has no place anywhere, including especially here in Canada. Is harboring Khalistani terrorists in their own backyard. What has been surprising in this situation is the response of countries like the UK, New Zealand, who have stood with Canada and her terrorists. And we will discuss why. But in this video, you will also see the most surprising, intriguing, and perhaps the most important part of the India-Canada story, the insidious role of the USA, and how it has been pulling the strings from the background to put pressure on India. But the question is, why? Why is the US involved? What benefit do they have in antagonizing India, a country they call a strategic ally? Well, this one's gonna be a roller coaster, so strap in. The current diplomatic tensions between India and Canada are at an all time high. The tensions have been brewing because of Canada's harboring of Khalistani terrorists and their sympathizers in Canada, who have been openly threatening Indian officials and embassies in Canada for years. The latest tension stems from the murder of Khalistani Hardeep Singh Nidjar in Canada in 2023. The Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau blamed India for Nidjar's death, but he has, till date, not provided any solid proof for this claim. Trudeau referred to this guy as a Sikh leader, but this is not a Sikh leader. This is a Khalistani terrorist. In 2020, the Indian government declared him a terrorist under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act or the UAPA. He was allegedly involved in financing terrorist activities aimed at destabilizing India. He was also accused of recruiting individuals for terrorist training camps and supporting violent organizations in India. Recently, Trudeau stated that he would interrogate Indian diplomats regarding Nidjar's death, accusing them of conspiring against Canada. He makes this accusation when Indian diplomats are being openly threatened by Khalistani terrorists. So in response, the Indian government withdrew its diplomats from Canada and requested their immediate return. India has decided to withdraw its High Commissioner Sanjay Kumar Varma and other senior diplomats and officials after the Canadian government named them as persons of interest for their alleged role in the killing of pro Khalistani leader Hardeep Singh Nidjar. Indian External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar also expressed a lack of faith in Canada. So Akshay Kumar unfortunately has to come home and make more movies. Now, the Western media is portraying this as Canada forcing Indian diplomats out, which is misleading. The withdrawal was a proactive measure by India after learning about the threats against against its diplomats made by Khalistanis from Canadian territory. Again, remember, to this day, Trudeau has not provided any proof to back his claims. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has confessed that his government had no concrete evidence whatsoever when it initially accused India of being involved in the killing of Khalistani terrorist Hardeep Singh Nijan. What do you mean you have no evidence? You can't just claim something if you don't have any proof. Like, if that's the case, I can say that Trudeau really enjoys wearing women's underwear. And Jagmeet Singh and Trudeau are secret lovers. What's my proof? Well, let's just say that I have the same amount of proof that Trudeau has against India. So let's understand why harboring Khalistani terrorists on Canadian soil is a horrible look for Canada. The Khalistani movement is a Sikh separatist terrorist movement aimed at creating an independent Sikh homeland called Khalistan, meaning the land of the pure. Ironically, the Khalistanis only claim Indian Punjab, but not an inch of Pakistani Punjab, which is bigger and also contains Lahore, the historical capital of the Sikh empire. I wonder why. It can't be because Khalistanis are bitches of the Pakistani ISI who funds and owns them. No. That certainly can't be the reason. The Khalistan insurgency was one of the bloodiest terrorist insurgencies in independent Indian history, which resulted in the murder of thousands of Hindus and Sikhs who did not agree with the idea of Khalistan. It also resulted in terror attacks overseas, most infamously the Air India Flight 182 bombing in 1985, which killed 329 people and was the deadliest terror attack in Canadian history till today. 23 जून 1985 को खालिस्तानी प्रतिक्तवादियों ने मॉन्ट्रियल से मुंबई आ रहे एयर इंडिया के विमान कनिष्क में एक टाइम बम रखा, जिसकी वजह से आयरलैंड के तट के पास विमान में विस्फोट हुआ 
और तीन सौ उनतीस लोग मौत के मुंह में समा गए नाइन इलेवन से पहले यह इतिहास का सबसे बड़ा चरमपंथी हमला था कनाडा के ब्रिटिश कोलंबिया में पीली पगड़ी पहने एक शख्स ने तीन हजार पांच डॉलर खर्च कर बिजनेस क्लास के दो हवाई टिकट खरीदे और उसके साथ ही वैंकूवर से उड़ने वाले दो विमानों में डायनामाइट और टाइमर से भरे दो सूट खालिस्तानी After the Khalistani movement was finished in India many Khalistanis escaped to places like Canada exploiting their lax immigration policies on top of that the Canadians were getting cheap labor so they were happy to look the other way the Sikh community in Canada has grown at a very fast pace in fact since 1991 the Sikhs in Canada have grown by 400% so the Sikhs now have big populations in important political areas in Canada and thus have become an important vote bank for Canadian politicians the Khalistanis have been able to hijack Sikh politics to a very large extent in Canada and have been able to send many pro Khalistani politicians into the Canadian parliament politicians like NDP leader Jagmeet Singh who has attended pro Khalistani rallies in his past who for a very long time refused to disavow the terrorists responsible for the air india bombing who was responsible for working with khalistanis to share a fraudulent toolkit during the farmers protests in india another one of these people is liberal mp sukh dhaliwal who have attended khalistani events in the past as well manjinder singh and narinder singh two members of a khalistani gurdwara in surrey who threatened to shoot the indian high commissioner also seem to have a direct connection with mp sukh dhaliwal you can hear khalistani slogans in various canadian political rallies So how have these Khalistanis been able to create so much influence in Canadian politics? Well, two reasons: money power and political power. Let's talk about money power first. Many of these Khalistanis use the idea of Khalistan to portray themselves as political activists to hide their true intentions, which is their involvement in the Canadian drug trade. Since the 1980s, many Punjabi Khalistani gangs have been established in Canada by gangsters like Bindi Johal and Jimmy Dosanjh, gangs like Johal, Dhak Duhre, Sanghera, Mali Buttar and Kangs. Over 20% are of Punjabi origin despite Punjabis being just around 1% of the population of Canada. Think about that. In 2021, Toronto police arrested 20 people including 9 Khalistanis and procured drugs from them like 450 kilograms of cocaine, 182 kilograms of crystal meth, 430 kilograms of marijuana and 30 oxycodone pills. The street value of which was 61 million dollars. In fact, Mexican drug cartels have also used these Khalistani gangs to expand their operations in Canada. These cartels use two ways to expand into Canada. One, use local gangs to expand their network, many of which are Khalistani drug gangs, and secondly, use long haul trucking to transport their drugs across borders. Orders. and here's where things get interesting according to the sikh political action committee 150000 sikhs are involved in the trucking industry punjabis in general own more than half of the asian owned trucking businesses in america according to the north american punjabi trucking association 40% of truckers in california are sikhs in the last 3 years more than 30000 sikhs have become truck drivers i hope you can start to connect the dots now and so it's very important for you to remember what i'm about to say right now these khalistanis aren't just terrorists They're also drug traffickers that are bringing in harmful drugs and supplying them to millions of Canadians. They're bringing gang violence to the streets of Canada. It is only a matter of time before Canadians start dying of drug overdoses as a result of these Khalistanis. It is only a matter of time that ordinary Canadians start getting caught in the crossfire of this Khalistani gang violence. Maybe then Canada will wake up and act, but by then it would have been too late and now if we talk about how these khalistanis have gained political power we need to understand that it all comes from their control of various gurdwaras because to send local politicians and national politicians into the government canada has a system called the primaries and many primaries start from the gurdwaras and these khalistanis use their money power and their gang power to hijack these gurdwaras so then the 10 20 khalistanis that control these gurdwaras control all the religious donations and cash of the gurdwara but also then have a lot of 
influence over all the families that visit that Gurdwara. And also remember that a vast majority of Khalistanis belong to just one caste, which is the Jat Sikh caste. And a majority of Sikhs in Canada are from that Jat Sikh caste as well, which is why Khalistanis are able to do this caste mobilization quite effectively to then go on and control these Gurdwaras. And so then they're able to send these Khalistani sympathizers into the government, like Harjit Singh Sajjan, who was the defense minister of Canada from 2015 to 2021, and who is currently the minister of international development. He's been accused of being a Khalistani sympathizer when Trudeau visited India in 2018, the spotlight was on his delegation, which included several ministers and MPs with ties to Khalistani sympathizers. This led to a major embarrassment for Trudeau when it was revealed that Jaspal Adwal, a convicted Khalistani terrorist, was invited to a reception hosted by the Canadian High Commission in India. Atwal had been convicted in 1987 for the attempted murder of an Indian politician in British Columbia. Imagine that. This would have been like if the Americans visited Israel and invited the leader of Hamas to be a part of their official delegation. Now, Obviously, this pissed off the Indians a lot. So much so that Amrinder Singh, the then Chief Minister of Punjab, who didn't even belong to the BJP then, he was part of the Congress party. When I was in America, and next I was to go to Canada, but this Khalistani lobby got together, all these surgeons and the others. I'm not going to meet him. He's with coming to Punjab. We can, somebody can do it. Sajjan Misa, defense minister. He had publicly refused to meet Trudeau and accused him of being a Khalistani sympathizer. And as a result of the appeasement of Khalistanis by the Canadian government, Khalistanis have become brazen in attacking Indians and the Hindu diaspora. Attacks on temples, including vandalism, have created fear for the Hindu community. Incidents of vandalism against symbols of Hindu identity continue. One of the biggest and oldest temples in Canada was vandalized and defaced with certain Khalistan referendum posters over the weekend. And what is shocking is that this is the fourth such incident by the Khalistanis in Canada in just this one year. Already in 2024, there have been multiple attacks on Indian temples and multiple threats made against Indian officials and members of the Indian diaspora. So then there's a natural question here. Okay, well, the Khalistanis have a lot of money and political influence, but why would the Canadian government, and particularly Justin Trudeau, side with a Khalistani terrorist over a democracy like India? Well, here's where things get interesting because Trudeau is using India as a scapegoat to protect his own failing political career. See, recently, Jagmeet Singh's new Democratic Party, which was a major ally of Trudeau, had withdrawn its support from the Trudeau's minority government. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau suffered an unexpected blow on Wednesday when new Democratic Party, which was helping him keep his minority liberal government in power, withdrew its automatic support. According to the Ipsos poll, only 26% of Canadians consider Trudeau a good candidate for Prime Minister, whereas 44% Canadians prefer his rival, Pierre Polyev. Ipsos poll done exclusively for Global News. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev remains the top pick for PM at 45%. Trudeau has 26% and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has 23 only 7% of Canadians strongly approve of Trudeau's leadership right now. Trudeau's Liberal Party has also lost major elections in strongholds like Montreal and Toronto, weakening their leadership and chances for re-election. In fact, there is such little trust in the public towards Justin Trudeau that his own party members are calling for Justin Trudeau to step down. And this situation, this abject failure of Justin Trudeau, is pushing him to seek support from the Khalistani vote bank, the one constant that he has. And now, let's pivot a little bit. Because we've talked about Canada, but Canada is not the big dog here. Let's talk about who's really pulling the strings. Let's talk about America's role in this entire kerfuffle. Because they're basically Emperor Palpatine from the prequel trilogy, pulling the strings from the background to cause the dominoes to fall in a particular order. See, the US is the classic hegemonic power, akin to the colonial powers like Britain and Spain. Hegemonic powers tend to behave like the schoolyard bully. And so America's behavior can be understood by understanding the psychology of a bully. According to psychology, psychologist Albert Bandura, many bullies engage in aggressive behavior to establish and maintain dominance within a social hierarchy. Research shows that bullies often seek to exert control over others. Their behavior is driven by a desire to maintain or increase their social power. Bandura introduced the concept of moral disengagement, which bullies use to justify their harmful actions. They may rationalize their behavior by minimizing the harm they cause, blaming the victim, or convincing themselves that their actions are justified. This cognitive process allows them to 
engage in bullying without feeling any guilt or shame. Bullies also display intense narcissism. Narcissistic bullies believe that they are superior to others and often feel entitled to special treatment. This leads them to devalue their peers and see others as mere tools to reinforce their self-image. An example of this narcissism is America's narrative of Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was a 19th century American ideology that held that the United States was destined by God, nature and historical circumstances to expand across the North American continent. This belief justified westward expansion and underpinned American territorial growth throughout the 1800s. This term was coined by 1845 by journalist John L. O'Sullivan who argued that it was America's divine mission to spread democracy, civilization and capitalism across the continent. Basically, in simple terms, it was America's duty as ordained by God to civilize the Native Americans. However, in reality, they were using these esoteric concepts to acquire more land and more resources for themselves. And you can see a continuation of that narcissism in the Middle East as well. That it was the USA's God-given duty to spread democracy and American values in the Middle East, whereas in reality, it was a strategy to capture their oil reserves and protect their hegemonic interests. We've seen examples of this in Iran in 1953 when the US helped overthrow Iran's Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh after he nationalized British oil interests to help the Iranians. But the Americans didn't like this because it hurt US and UK businesses and America's God-given right to cheap oil. Similar thing happened in Iraq in 2003. The US invaded Iraq under the pretext of Saddam Hussein developing weapons of mass destruction. Despite there being absolutely zero evidence of any weapons of mass destruction, the US claimed that Iraq was behind 9-11 despite there being zero evidence of Iraq's involvement. In fact, the two countries that had the most involvement in 9-11 were Saudi Arabia and Pakistan arguably, which had sheltered Osama for over a decade right under America's nose. But America, the great superpower, could not accept that it had made a strategic mistake in making shit allies. Because thinking of Pakistan as your ally is like thinking Ramsey Bolton from Game of Thrones is a normal, well-adjusted individual. The goal again was to control Iraq's oil resources and shift Middle Eastern power, shielded by the concept of America's manifest destiny. So the USA bulldozed the concerns of the UN and the Global South countries and invaded Iraq, resulting in millions of dead Iraqis and thousands of dead American soldiers, ultimately resulting in the rise of ISIS and Iran becoming the foremost power in the Middle East, directly undermining American interests. What America did to themselves in the Middle East reminds me of this clip from a famous Indian-Canadian comedian. You kill me? Hey, fuck you! <laughs> I kill me. <laughs> And then, of course, who can forget Afghanistan? The US launched its war in Afghanistan after the 9-11 attacks, aiming to dismantle the Taliban regime, which according to them, harbored Al-Qaeda. But again, the Americans continued to ignore the real culprit, Pakistan, which helped create the Taliban and was home to the world's most wanted terrorists, including Osama bin Laden. The war stretched for over two decades, causing widespread destruction, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Afghans and thousands of dead American soldiers again. And at the end of the day, America had to exit Afghanistan ignominiously, handing power right back to the Taliban, whom they ironically vowed to wipe out 20 years ago. But this time it was different. They also left the Taliban with tens of millions of dollars worth of state-of-the-art weapons that they abandoned when exiting the country with their tail between their legs. For a hegemonic superpower and for the greatest military on earth, America hasn't really won a single war since the Second World War, where ironically, the biggest victories against the Nazis were won by the Soviet Union. So now we understand the psychology of America as a hegemonic superpower. Now we can begin to understand their actions towards India. See, the US wants to maintain its global dominance and a rising India could challenge this balance. Jamie Dimon, chairman and CEO of JP Morgan, America's biggest bank, says India can become a $7 trillion economy by the end of the decade. And right now we see India strengthening its ties with countries like Russia and also forging alliances with Arab countries and countries of the global south. The US wants countries to align with America's global interests lock, stock, and barrel, like America's personal bitch, the United Kingdom. India, on the other hand, very much wants to be a US ally. In fact, I would argue that Modi is probably the most pro-American prime minister India has ever had. If you look at events like Howdy Modi and Namaste Trump, it seems like Modi does really want to develop a strong relationship with the US. But what's key here is that India wants to do it on her own terms, keeping her interests in mind as well. India's independent stance on issues like 
Russia concerns the US. But the US being the narcissistic hegemonic superpower that it is, wishes to bend India to its will. They obviously want to avoid a military conflict with India since India also has a gigantic battle-hardened army that just gave China a bloody nose in recent border conflicts. So the US is using other tools at their disposal. Tools like NGOs. The US has been criticized for funding NGOs and media outlets that seek to undermine Indian democracy. Many of these organizations were involved in the opposition to the abrogation of Article 370, supporting the farmers' protests, opposing the Citizenship Amendment Act, as well as the Uniform Civil Code. In 2022, Indian government cancelled 6,000 NGO permits who used to receive such foreign funding. The American government-funded United States Commission on International Religious Freedom releases report after report every year bemoaning the lack of religious freedom in India. Despite the fact that a non-Christian has never been the president of the USA, while India has already had a non Hindu Prime Minister and a Muslim President. The US routinely hosts the leader of opposition Rahul Gandhi as he openly asks for foreign intervention in India to overthrow the democratically elected Indian government. So the surprising thing is that the, the so-called defenders of democracy, which are the United States, uh, European countries, seem to just be oblivious that a huge chunk of the democratic model has come undone, right? which is a real problem. With regards to, uh, and, and frankly, we are, the opposition is fighting that battle, right? And it's not just an Indian battle. It's actually a much more important battle. Please understand here, clearly what, what he was trying to imply is that since it is a global good, let them come in and intervene and preserve this global good. Isn't this what uh, colonial powers were trying to do? Where he routinely meets organizations that are allegedly connected to George Soros and Pakistani ISI. In April this year, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who used to be a staunch ally of India, accused the US of trying to topple her government. And ultimately, the Americans were successful in doing so, installing an American puppet named Muhammad Yunus in her place. The US also played a key role in providing the so-called intelligence to Canada regarding the killing of Khalistani terrorist Hardeep Singh Nidja. The Americans apparently offered key context that helped Canada solidify their suspicion against the Indian government. This so-called intelligence, which still hasn't been shared, was shared through the Five Eyes Alliance, a network between the US, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So you can see that America is using the similar soft regime change tactics that it has used in countries like Bangladesh and many South American countries to cause regime change and install governments that essentially function as puppet governments of the United States. But India has sent a message that is loud and clear. Support for Khalistani terrorism will not be tolerated, even with so-called allies. India has made it clear that countries of the Global South do not wish to be dictated and controlled by Western hegemonic powers. The Global South countries like India believe that the world should be more collaborative rather than run at the whims and fancies of a handful of countries. The USA being the top hegemonic power of the world does not wish for India to have an independent policy. They would rather have India as a vassal state, the way UK, Canada or Australia are. And India is pushing back. They've taken control of the narrative as well, leaving Trudeau scrambling to keep up. And it's becoming increasingly clear that if Canada wants to rebuild its international standing, especially with India, something's got to give. And that something might just be a new political leader. So I want to ask you, how do you think India has handled this political crisis with Canada? How do you think India should handle America's interference in India's domestic affairs? Do you see America as a long-term strategic partner? Do you still think that America and India should be long-term allies? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. As usual guys, if you enjoy these long form English explainer videos, let me know what I should make the next video on. I will see you for the next episode and until then, stay happy, stay healthy. I will see you for the next one and to all of you, a second for now.